The first speaker is Kafui De, huh? Uh, is she here? Oh, he, is he here? <laughs> um, the, this, how do you say it? De Rasa. De Rasa. He's an, he is an M8 uh, and he uh, is doctor? Yes. It is like doctor uh, and he's going to talk about uh, dopamine control of sleep-wake states uh, from Duke University. Good morning, you all doing okay? All right, fantastic. So I, I, I was told I had to fit my thesis into a 10 minute talk, so I took out the conclusions, I took out the introduction, I took out the results, and here's what we've got. <laughs> Electrophysiological correlates of psychiatric disease. Again, uh, my name is Kafu Jarasa, and I am an M8 Meyerhoff scholar. So a little bit of an outline of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, first, I'll give you an overview of human behavior, talk to you about psychiatric illness, give you some background on schizophrenia, present some brief experimental results, and give you the conclusions as well. So human behavior, what is human behavior? It's why some of us are sleeping now, it's why some of us are awake now, it's what you were doing last night, it's our relationships with our mothers and our children. The whole compilation of everything that we do is tied up in the context of what we call human behavior. And you can see all kinds of things from this picture. So what psychiatric illness is, in brief, it's when human behavior goes bad. We have it on the moderate end where you have your personality disorders to the extreme end where you have things like schizophrenia and depression, what have you. So the, the reason why this is important is because psychiatric disorders are listed in developing countries as the number one cause of burden of disease and, and developed countries as the number two cause of burdens of disease. And these are your depressions, your schizophrenia, your bipolar disorders, or what have you. And perhaps the most critical thing to remember about psychiatric illness is that we don't really understand what it is so our treatments are focused much more on ameliora ameliorating symptoms as opposed to curing the underlying disease. So we treat symptoms, not necessarily cure disease. So it would almost be like treating a fever for someone who has a bacterial infection as opposed to giving an antibiotic agent. So the reason why this is so particularly difficult is because of the complexity associated with the brain. So if you think of something like the liver, you have this hodgepodge of cells. Well, the brain has 50 billion cells called neurons. And so it would be one thing in simplicity if you were dealing with these 50 billion neurons, but it's even more difficult than that. And so as you can see, the brain is organized, the cells are organized in different areas called structures. And so what you have is each of these structures can talk to cells in it that make up a different structure. So now there's a level of complexity called the circuit, at the circuit level. And this is two circuits that you can see here, one in black that deals with movement and one in red that de deals with emotional processing. So if you can think of all the things that the brain does and all these circuits and all these areas connecting, you see this whole nother level of complexity associated with studying psychiatric illness. But it gets worse than that. So if you look now, the cells that talk from one structure to the next, between each of these connections, there's what's called a synaptic cleft. And so there's this signal that's released from the neuron or the cell at the beginning sending the signal, and that's called a neurotransmitter. It binds with a postsynaptic receptor, and then there's signaling that happens in the cell afterwards. So now there's another level of complexity because each cell can have a different type of connection with a different neurotransmitter, which can bind to a different postsynaptic receptor. So now it's a next, le next layer of complexity. To make it even worse, now you have these cells, and these are cells in striatum called medium spiny neurons, and what you see is that each cell can have different neurotransmitter receptors and receive different neurotransmitter projections from different structures. So now there's a level of complexity that happens at this level. To make things even more complicated, now once you're inside of the cell, there's all of this signaling that goes on because of the biochemistry. So there's this level of complexity that happens at all these layers, and if something goes wrong at any of these layers, you can have what's called psychiatric illness. So the difficulty is people haven't found ways to study all of this at once, study the circuitry, study the anatomy, and study what's going on in a protein level as well. So schizophrenia is perhaps one of the most devastating um, psychiatric illnesses, in my opinion. It affects 1% of the world population, and it really doesn't discriminate from person to person. It has what's called the classic positive symptoms, and these are the things people typically think about, which are the hallucinations, the delusions, the bizarre behaviors, as well as the negative symptoms, which are really the flat affect, the lack of social interest, and the cognitive deficits as well. So they're, they're 
schizophrenia, because it's, it's defined based on symptoms, it's defined according to the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, which is the DSM in the fourth version, uh, as having positive symptoms, negative symptoms, um, social and occupational dysfunction lasting greater than six months. So the, the way we wanted um, to approach this problem is by taking advantage of really an electrophysiological approach to study the circuits as well as genetic approach to really study what was going on at the protein level as well. So schizophrenia classically in the 70s, they found that at least the positive symptoms were associated with too much of the dopamine signaling. And the way dopamine signaling works is that dopamine is released in the synapse, binds to the postsynaptic receptor, and then the signal's transmitted. So the action of dopamine stops when dopamine is pumped back into the first cell through this terminal. And this is the terminal that amphetamine works at. So amphetamine reverses this terminal, causing more dopamine release into the synapse. And cocaine, cocaine works by blocking this terminal as well. So what we wanted to do was basically create a mouse that we could look at, which would model at least some of the aspects of schizophrenia. And the way this is done is you just remove the transporter. So if you take out the transporter, these mice now have five to 10 times the amount of normal dopamine. And dopamine stays in the synapse, which is this area, 100 times as long. So the idea is these mice have too much dopamine now. So if you look at the behavior, if you look at them in their home case, their behavior is fairly normal. But as soon as you stress them, they start running around in circles continuously for eight, anywhere between four to six hours. So they have now these aspects of this really hyperactive, what would seem psychotic behavior that you can model in an animal as well. So what we do in our lab is particularly we focus on electrophysiological recordings. And what you see here, this is 32 electrodes. This is another 32 electrodes. Each of them are the size of a piece of a hair, so about 35 microns. And we implant those into the brains of animals during surgery. And then when they wake up, we can basically record their neural activity or their brain activity while they're awake and behaving. So we can see what's going on at a behavioral level, we can see what's going on at a circuit level, and we've manipulated the genetics so we know what's going on at a biochemical level as well. So the experimental setup for my PhD was we were implanting these animals in hippocampus, and it's a great structure to look at circuit-wise because it connects with a lot of the other structures in the brain. Um, we were basically connecting the animals and then studying them for 12 hours, and we chose 12 hours during the light cycle because we could basically see how the animal's sleep-wake patterns changed across 12 hours. You know, mice aren't like humans, so their, their daytime is our night, and our night is their day, and they'll tend to have six or seven cycles of continuous waking up and falling asleep through this time. So if you look at um, the data, this is a wild-type animal. You know, sleep is defined according to three classic states, awake, asleep, or non-slow wave sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep. And that's where dreaming typically tends to happen in humans. So if you look at the brain activity patterns in slow wave sleep, it's called slow wave sleep because it has a lot of power in the slow wave area or the low frequency area. Waking and REM sleep have a lot more power in the high frequency area. And then there's a slight distinction that happens in rodents when there's much higher power in this area, which is called the theta area. So when we looked at these dopamine transporter knockout mice, the first thing that we saw was that slow wave sleep, as you can see in red, was fairly normal. There was a lot more power in the low frequency areas, less power in the high frequency areas. When we looked at REM sleep, again, the pattern looked very similar. And when we looked at these guys in their home cage, so when they were habituated, their brain patterns looked very normal. But what happened was when we stressed these animals, we found that their brain patterns went into a pattern that was almost identical to what you typically observe during REM sleep. So these animals are awake, they're running around in circles, but their brain activity is almost identical to what happens during this dreamlike mentation state um, that you see in humans. So what you can also do in these animals is that you can get rid of dopamine. So they don't recycle dopamine, like I said. So all of dopamine comes from de novo synthesis. So if you give a tyrosine hydroxylase inhibitor, you get rid of all the dopamine in these animals, and you turn off several circuits. One of the circuits you turn off is the movement circuit as well. So they develop a phenotype that's very much like Parkinson's disease. So these animals, you can take them, you can twist their tails, you can hang them on the side of the cage, and they'll stay there for hours and hours and hours. And what we noticed over time was that these animals weren't falling asleep. When we looked at their brain activity, we realized that their brain activity had gone into this pattern that was almost identical to what you observe during slow wave sleep in these animals. But as we're looking at their muscle activity, they definitely have muscle activity. They're looking at us. They're blinking. They're not going to sleep but their brain looks just like slow wave sleep activity. And what we found was we can recover sleep in these animals by giving a dopaminergic agonist, specific, one that was specific for the D2 dopamine receptor. So here's why this was particularly important, and I'll, I'll tie this all together for you all in the next minute or so. When we looked at these dopamine transporter knockout mice, when they were awake and running around, if we gave them an antipsychotic agent, their brain, power, their brain activity went back into the normal power. 
When we took these animals, we got rid of all of dopamine, they stopped, they had this full suppression of REM sleep that could be recovered by giving a D2 agonist. So we were finding that REM sleep was turned on and off. This dreamlike state was being turned on and off by the exact same pathway that you treat when someone's uh, mentally ill or has schizophrenia to turn off the psychosis. So as we began to search the literature, we found that there was this common idea that was around about 100 years ago from the founding fathers of psychiatry, both the Freuds and the Emil Kreplins. And what they suggested was when people became psychotic, it wasn't that their brain started doing anything abnormal. They were suggesting that their brain was actually doing something that was very normal, just at the wrong time. And they said, they said everybody is psychotic. It's just typically confined to periods when you're asleep. So everybody's brain. So everyone's brain has the ability to generate sights that aren't going on in the outside world, sounds that aren't going on in the outside world, these abnormal constructs where you're at your mom's house, then you're at work, and then you're back in the lab again. You're, all of your experience are working because we're delusional. And, and so <laughs> they said that this was the same social construct that happened. So psychosis was simply activation of dreamlike patterns during aberrant periods. So again, um, these are just the conclusions that I, um, some of them I presented today, some of them I didn't have time to. But again, we can see this REM-like activity in the dopamine transporter knockout mice. We can give them amphetamine and recapitulate the symptoms. Um, we found that REM sleep was modulated by the same pathway um, as psychosis. And finally, um, overarching, all of this story tied together for us. It's something that hopefully can be translated to humans. So those are my thank yous, thank you all for being here. <laughs> they have this thing called decreased REM latency, which means when you go to sleep during the night, there's about 60 to 90 minutes before you go into your first episode of dreaming. It typically tends to happen 15, 20 minutes in these schizophrenics. So they can get in and out of REM sleep and in and out of different parts of their sleep wake cycle a lot earlier. But yeah, the, the, the correlate still hasn't been completely tied together in humans. Yeah, so the, the, the synthesis level is actually much lower in these animals. And, and the reason it is is because dopamine then tends to stay in the synapse for a really long period of time. So they're constantly synthesizing, but the amount that they synthesize is less to keep them at that five to tenfold increase. Learn something in med school, huh? Good for you. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the real challenge is the brain is constantly changing. And it, it's not just, you know, when people are in the first two years of life. It constantly changes throughout adolescence. So there might be changes of other neurotransmitter levels, whether it's serotonin or norepinephrine or dopamine, that really seems to set the system off. But there's absolutely something occurring before the symptoms even appear. Yeah, I mean, so the, the brain is, goes through these dynamic state regulations. And so you switch really quickly to think about you being awake and being asleep and being, a, your brain switches really quickly. But what, you, what they tend to find in people who are psychotic is that they'll have these dreams, and, and this typically will happen during the adolescent period, and then over time, they can't tell the difference between their dreams and reality. So they'll wake up and they'll say, hey, the government's after me, oh, that was just a dream. And then two months later, it's, there's some paranoia associated with that, and then there's a, you can no longer tell the difference because you've consolidated that dream as a real memory. Yeah, we, so we haven't looked at the, the sex differences um, yet. There's some slight difference between rodents and humans, as I said. And you even, there's, so there are two real peaks of schizophrenia, really the early on peak. It tends to happen a little later in females, but then there's another peak around 44 years old where it's more females than males as well. So there, there, there are differences. And the problem is that it's, schizophrenia is grouped as one disease when it's probably gonna turn out being like a fever is one disease when it's just not. <laughs>